Hey everyone, this is Stephanie from The Mission. This week we have another epic giveaway going on. We're giving away the Chili Pad Sleep Systems. So have you ever been too hot, too cold, getting into an epic battle with your spouse? I mean, I know Chad and I do that almost every night right now. I'm pulling on the covers, he's then getting hot, throws the covers on me, I throw them back on him and they end up on the floor. Anyways, it's a whole ordeal. I will spare you all the details. But with the Chili Pad Sleep System, it's been awesome because you put it, it's basically a mattress pad. You put some water in it and each side has its own remote. So Chad can make his side nice and cool. I can make my side nice and warm, turn it off when we don't want it anymore. But it's a really nice way to get deep sleep and be able to control the temperature to exactly what you want and what you feel comfortable at. It's been game changing for Chad and I. So go to mission.org slash giveaway or click the link in the show notes and enter your email for a chance to win the Chili Pad Sleep Systems. We have a few of them to give away. So chances are good. Good luck. I'm Alec Baldwin, and you are listening to Mission Daily. Selected as Best of 2018 by Apple, Mission Daily is the number one podcast for accelerated learning. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Mission Daily. Today's guest is Mark Craney. Mark currently serves as the COO of SignalFX a SaaS-based monitoring and analytics platform for cloud-native companies to monitor their online and digital infrastructure. Prior to that, he had a seven-year stint at the renowned venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz. In today's episode, Mark and Ian sit down to discuss Mark's background in the venture capital space, why he got out of that to join the team at SignalFX, and his approach to recruiting and developing the most talented people in any given field. Stay tuned for more from the legendary Mark Craney. Welcome to Mission Daily. I'm Ian Faison, Chief Content Officer here at Mission.org. And in studio, Mark, what's going on? You, man. (laughs) You know, you're really what's going on. Uh, We are excited to have you today. You have one of the, uh, you know, I'm sure you get it, get it a lot, but you have a section of Hard Thing About Hard Things that was one of my favorite sections ever in, in a business book or any book because it was talking about hiring a new sales guy and it was exciting uh, for me to read that for the first time and it's exciting to have you here in studio. Well, happy to be here. So we're going to get into a little bit of of your background. We're going to talk about some cool stuff that you did at A16Z and we're going to talk about what you're working on at SignalFX. I want to start with what was your thought when you read the book of how you were portrayed by Ben? Ooh, this is a curveball. Uh, well, it's good to get rectified, I think. Ben wrote another book. Uh, I think it was announced this week. It's coming out in the fall. Oh, no kidding. So yeah, yeah one on culture. Um, my thought was his perspective was kind of one-sided of how they thought about me, what he kind of left out and I think is rectifying the next go around was what I thought about them. So in any type of recruiting situation, it's a two-way street and you've got to be, uh, there's got to be a fit both ways. And I don't want to give away the punchline, but yeah. uh, I think Ben's going to rectify that in his book that's released this fall. So, I love it. That's yeah, great. It'll be fun. So it's great, great title, at least a little section where he puts my side in there so i just love that he was looking for one thing and trying to like pattern match based off of feedback and met you do you feel like that thing is one of the mistakes that a lot of people make when they're hiring is like they're trying to do some pattern matching or something based off of what someone else told them rather than following kind of like their playbook or what they think the job that needs to be done? I think back then that, you know, and if you read Ben's book, they they were learning on the fly, right? So they didn't really have a a real deep set of criteria, hiring criteria. Uh, I think Ben had been through four or five of my predecessors before Mm -hmm. he got there. So it wasn't like they were skilled at it. And you know, so knowing what your criteria is and, you know, what's going to be a good fit for the, the situation. I think Ben did a good job kind of articulating why it did turn out 
the way it turned out, at least in that scenario. But you know, knowing what you need at the time is is probably one of the more important criteria. And you know, typecasting off of you know image and or if you look left and right and what everybody else has might not fit your situation. So they were you know behind. I mean, dramatically behind and in deep trouble. Uh, the thing he left out of the book was I wasn't looking to come out west. I wasn't looking to join them. I really wasn't looking. You know, their culture was not a fit for me either at at all. In fact, the recruiter called me multiple times and I told him no multiple times. That's the piece that he kind of left out was I said, no, I'm not. I mean, that they called it oopsware. Yep. Uh, his competition was, you know, who I knew his competition. I, a lot of his competition were, it was a company called Blade Logic that I had worked with. You know, the, the guys running that company were three, four years ahead of them on the product end and the go to market. I knew they're getting killed. And I finally, I was getting on a plane to come out here and agreed to uh, Lily in the airport to say, look, I'll go see Ben and Mark, right? I wouldn't mind meeting them, but there's no way I'm going to take this job because it's just, it's not a right fit. It's probably not the culture fit. It's, you know, it's just not going to be for me. So frankly, it was the connection uh, with Ben and I that, that kind of put us over the hump. So on my side anyway. So I use Chad, Stephanie, and I talk about this all the time that it's one of the models that we use for hiring to like remove some of that bias or whatever it is that you want to call it of like, if you are looking for something that is like a type of person that it's just not, not going to be the the right thing. Like you mm-hmm. need to look at like, what is the job that's going to be done and how do they fit into that? And we've had situations where the person might not look the way that that you think Mm -hmm. they should look they might not talk the way they might not be a good enough communicator they might be too good of a communicator you know all those things but one of the parts and this will be the last thing that we'll stop talking about the book but i just love that you had a playbook and you had like your way of selling and being an expert at sales and how you thought about building a team and how you thought about developing talent and that was the thing where it's like that was the coolest part to me to see someone who was or to read that and to have someone that was a sales leader that was so confident and like this is where i want to build any sales organization that i want to be a part of that to me was like man that is just that's a it's a cool way to look at things how did you develop that like confidence and that that playbook i you know i think it's you know anything that at least that i've done i want to be really good at so you know i grew up on a in a large family business, large family farm in, in, uh, Idaho family business. And we had a, you know, a system for success and grew up in an athletic background. I mean, there was a system, there's a, you know, team sports, there's a way of, you know, there's an offensive defense or special teams. There's an attention to detail. And I really applied that when I decided to go into sales right after school, I wanted, you know, I was going to be a pro. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it right. And I'm going to learn everything I need to know about it and get extremely competent. And when you get that competence, you're going to have that conviction and the courage to go do the right things. And and I see a lot of, you know, I have this discussion with the younger crowd coming out of school these days. And I said, look, you know, this isn't just a job. I mean, this is what you do now. So if, you know, whatever you did in, you know, in high school or college to get really good at something, you need to apply the same type of discipline and focus to that to become a pro because you're getting paid for it. That's the definition of a professional. And if you're going to be good and or great, you need to knuckle down and study, practice, drill, rehearse and and get good at it. So, and I, you know, I I was in some good systems too. I mean, ideally picking the right uh, early career mentors and the right teams uh, and being part of those type of systems. Because a lot of this is, there's a lot of coaching tree to this and you were, you know, ex West Point military. And I, you know, grew up in a, from an athletic background standpoint, if you think about coaching trees, the valley is just littered with coaching yep. trees. And in a, the genealogy and the DNA, if you, if you unpack that and do a little analysis, you'll see these ways of doing things uh, tend to sprout and a whole new forest get built because of that. So another thing from a criteria to stamp, standpoint that I tell the, the younger crowd is, you know, make sure early on that you're picking the right the right mentors and the right coaches and the right people you're going to learn and grow from, but also uh, you'll be able to extend that tree down the line. Yeah. And if you don't know the language, you got to go learn it. I think a lot of people that are out there that are asking for mentors and looking for that, they don't do the homework. 
Like if once you get the meeting with that person, you need to be able to speak the language. Like you need to do the research. And now with technology, you can go read all their blog posts. You can you know, listen to their podcast episodes. You got to do the work. And I think a lot of people show up with this kind of, well, I, I need a mentor so that I can learn. No, you need to go learn. And then the mentor allows you to like personalize it to yourself. Like that's the mm-hmm. value of the mentor is that they're giving you feedback on who you are, not just like broad knowledge. The knowledge is out there. Yeah, I did seven years at Andreessen Horowitz and technical founders coming to me and say, teach me how to go to market in yeah. a 30 minute, uh, you know, session. And it's, you know, it's just, it doesn't work that way. So, I mean, having, having to go through it, you have to learn the hard way, but getting a lot of mentors and or hiring in the right type of talent uh, as you grow is is super critical. What positions did you play in uh, college? Ooh, I played three. I was recruited as an option quarterback, hence the almost uh, going down the military. Wait, I didn't realize you were yeah. a quarterback? Option, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would, you know, perfect fit with the academies. Uh, so I did get a little recruited there. Lasted a week, broke my hand, throwing hand, and uh, moved to cornerback. Started three years there, and my last year they made, moved me to inside linebacker. So it's kind of an odd combo. Yeah, no kidding. So I went in at 165, left at 205, so. Jeez. Yeah. And the reason why I ask is because like, did you ever feel like you were a top player on the team? Like, were you one of the best players? Were you one of the best starters? Oh, yeah, absolutely. No Be- doubt. Because <laughs> the thing that's so funny that I felt when I played football was I felt I, our, my high school team won uh, the championship, so we were really good. I was the 22nd best player on the team. I was the worst starter on offense or defense, but I was a starter. And the reason why I say that is like, I never felt like I was talented enough to be a leader back then. I felt like I could like lead with my actions, but like I wasn't good enough, you know, like who's going to listen to the guy who sucks. And I always felt like I wanted to put myself in a place in my career where I could be the best at whatever I was doing. And I think a lot of people feel that like imposter syndrome of not being the best, of not having the talent to be able to lead especially like a lot of founders feel that way, I think. Did you ever feel like that there was imposter syndrome either like in your career or in the founders that you were working with when you were at Andrews Norris? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, I think particularly early on, I think really that's a time on bike and a competence issue, right? You get enough time on bike, you get enough at-bats or enough tackle drills, whether it's an athletic event and or FaceTime with a customer or time on you know, writing code, then, you know, that's kind of one of the overarching theses that Andreessen Horowitz was, you know, investing in these technical product centric founders that have kind of earned and learned a secret, kind of something no one else, you know, knows. Where I think they get a little out of water is once they go do the founding part and get up and running, they, you know, there's a lot more to building a company and a business over time. And, and the ones that really, you know, figure that out and start to bring, you know, they're able to retract and retain and, and grow talent in all the other functions of the business, the ones where you see a lot of the successes. So do you think that you know, like your career up until this point has kind of really prepped you to be COO of Signal I mean, this is a this is a super hot company. Obviously, we've we've talked to a bunch of executives at Signal FX on on our different podcasts. We're really excited about the future of the company. Is this something where it's like you've kind of built to this point? Oh yeah, without a doubt. I mean, the, it was an opportunity to kind of run all the go to market. Karthik, the founder, technical founder, CEO, definitely a product guy. There's a lot of similarities to, and one of the attractions to this company and the role and the team was. It was a similar situation with Ben uh, when I joined Opsware. Was Ben's real hardcore product executive, and uh, Karthik similar, right? Mm-hmm. He, he was actually with Ben and Mark at, at LoudCloud, mm-hmm. and him and another one of the LoudCloud Opsware guys ran monitoring, you know, at LoudCloud. One of those goes on and was our chief architect at at Opsware. We subsequently sold that company to HP. That's when a lot of those guys got recruited into Facebook. Guys like Rajesh from Google and Arjit from Cisco, and that team built and rebuilt the monitoring stack at at uh, Facebook for several years before Karthik, who had split off on another path and went and joined this young lady here down here in Palo Alto, named Diane Green in the mm-hmm. early days of VMware, and and he essentially ran product 
for her from 2002 to like 2009. So he, you know, went down a different path, but those two got together, founded the company, brought in that core team that had kind of learned, you know, the early days. I mean, they were doing DevOps and kind of microservices. The coders were writing it. They were pushing code directly into production environments way back in 2007. The rest of the market all those waves are hitting the shore now with the global 2000, you know, even the high tech, the rest of the high tech vertical is converting to this new cloud, cloud native type stack that, you know, guys like Facebook, Yahoo, and in, in the Valley were doing years ago. So definitely put us in a good position to, you know, and this is a perfect position for me. It was, you know, someone like me who knows the go to market piece from the sales to marketing all the way back to customer success. Great match up with a, a, a great product exec like Karthik. And since joining a little under two years ago, I think we built out the whole team. So pretty excited about uh, where we're at right now and where we're going. Yeah, it seems like, you know, I was talking to, to Tom about this on marketing trends of like, what an advantageous position to be in when you have such a stacked team, right? It's like the position where we all want to be, right? Where you have like all stars at every position. I feel like a lot of, you know, similar stage companies, you know, you hear a lot of executives talk about you need exceptional talent at every position, but like actually doing it, actually convincing those people to join and getting them on there is the hard part. Mm -hmm. um, what was that like? Yeah. And I, you know, I think it's, there's four buckets that I think you need to kind of put together and, you know, going back to the sports analogies, particularly on building a, a, a championship team, you need an offensive defense and you got to have the special teams rounded out, at least from a football standpoint. Uh, when I joined, they, you know, one of the buckets was there. They built, they had the foundation and a platform of a great product. The market is massive. Right? Yep. There's this this big market. There's logs. There's metrics. There's this APM market, and then there the other piece is timing. What's going on in that market from an architectural shift standpoint? When they founded the company, it was early, right? And over time, the market started to come to them. So product market timing, all that was fitting. And then the the fourth bucket is the team. You put those four together particularly with that timing piece in there. And that's where it gets it, it gets really exciting. And every every day that goes by right now, you see it in the market. We see it with our prospects and our customers. What's happening in this move to cloud, not only to cloud, you know, people moving to public cloud and or private cloud and or hybrid multi-cloud, but all the layers on top of that, all the adoption of OSS, all the microservices type architectures moving from a monolith to a microservices type architecture, and then the ephemerality that's being adopted inside that, you know, the adoption of containers or for bursty workloads, things like serverless and functions as a service. Uh, it's super exciting from a, a timing standpoint. And it doesn't happen that often in this, where you have all these waves, there's like four or five big ones going on. And we've just, I think we've really nailed the uh, the uh, solution and the architecture that's really going to be future proof for a long long time. So you worked at Andreessen Horowitz for a long time. Clearly leaving there too long. Yeah, too long, right? Yeah. Clearly leaving there, you were going to leave for something big, for something that is you know creating the future, like you're doing with SignalFX. What was the decision like to say goodbye to uh, to your good buddies over there? I don't think I said goodbye. So, um, <laughs> look, I had a catbird seat. Uh, I initially, I'd, I had no intention to stay there more than a few months or a year. I initially went in just to, to get a better view and to pick a deal and as an EIR and get out of there. I kind of got sucked into it with the whole new model. And, and it was kind of interesting, this operating partner model. And it, and it got even more interesting. What I mean, look, I had a great time and built something I think was kind of special over there. But I'm an operator and yeah. and it's fun to like coach people up from the sidelines and or put programs in place and help them. And we were helping them a lot with, you know, our, our portfolio companies get in front of uh, the G2000, the large government agencies. We built this briefing program, this events program this sales and marketing, go to market boot camp, you know, to kind of coach people up. But at the end of the day, I enjoy the smell of napalm a lot more in the morning. <laughs> I, I like the granularity of operating on a day-to-day -day basis. And particularly when you can do it across not only the sales side, but marketing, customer success, and back 
into the product piece and make sure you're, you know, building, you know, great, great products and great experiences for your customers and, 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 you know, be able to help them from a value standpoint uh, in this cloud journey, you know, for a long, long time. So the uh, only thing I regret is not, I wish that I had done it earlier. So gotten out of there earlier, but I had a great time. It was fun. So that's hilarious. I think it's really interesting to look at. It's kind of like the difference between being a house cat and an outside cat. Yep. Right? Being cooped up in Sand Hill Road. That's house cat stuff. Well, I mean, there's a lot of people who go from founders to investors. Not a lot of people that go back from being an investor into uh, to start another company. It's funner at the point of the spear. You know, the getting shot at and shooting back is a lot funner. But, you know, different strokes, different folks. I want to talk about the uh, executive briefing program because this is something we've talked a little bit in the past about executive briefing centers, like what those are and talk through like why those are a good idea. But this was, this was, you know, first in class for a VC firm to build something this robust, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, others that I think, you know, had a few events or have a CIO council, yep. things of that nature. I mean, the, the, the early days of it were kind of interesting. I mean, initially I was hired uh, or went in to kind of help source deals on the enterprise side about half the time. The other half kind of go help Freddie and, you know, whoever entrepreneur with their go-to-market, more of kind of a counsel and advice standpoint. But what all the... <laughs> sort of caress. What, what all the entrepreneurs wanted, you know, they, you know, they want the advice, they want to know how to, but what they really needed was, hey, can you get me a meeting? Yep. Can you get me a meeting with XCIO or CTO or, you know, if it's more on the consumer side, CMO, whatever it is. And it's like, you know, I, I probably can, but, you know, A, that doesn't scale. And B, I'm not sure how you're how well you're going to do in that yep. meeting, right? And are you going to be able to get a second and a third? And it's more than just a meeting to uh, run through the whole process. So really more out of frustration and to just do it in bulk is I just started reaching out to my contacts. And it started out with, you know, I think six or eight the first quarter and it went to 30 and then 50 and then 100. And we happened to be moving and taking a little more space. They said, you know, let's take a little more space and give me a few rooms and I'll just fill them up. And, you know, whoever we invest in or are thinking about invest in, there's just going to be a G2000 execs and their teams in here on a day-to-day basis for the startups to, you know, shave their cycle time to market. The, the most interesting thing to me was the reaction from the corporate side and the hunger for what, what we end up calling curated innovation. And mm-hmm. that was essentially my pitch. We'd reach out to the these CXO levels and say, look, you know, we're kind of pointed the spear out here in the valley, Andreessen Horowitz. This is the early days too, that no one knew who Andreessen Horowitz was, but we're looking at a few hundred and eventually it was several thousand uh, funding opportunities in a year. Uh, you're not getting innovation from your large technology company providers like you used to. Things are just happening too quick, right? Because the cloud and social mobile, whatever, whatever it is. We'll go back, you know, inside our, you know, tell us about your initiatives, a lot of discovery and, you know, what's going on in your world. We'll go back in our, inside our portfolio or even outside our portfolio, other companies we've looked at that may be able to help you short, medium, long term. And uh, we'll curate up a list of these companies, share with you kind of our investment thesis, and then show you what that looks like with real entrepreneurs and, and founders. And hopefully it takes off. So that ended up being like, you know, at, at the hype time when I was there, it was 1,500, close to 2,000 of these, what we call one to many a year. And then we started doing bigger events as well. So it was a lot of fun. I mean, I think, yeah, as someone, you know, building a early stage company, it's the number one thing that every single startup has a problem with is getting qualified conversations with decision makers. Like it's the number one problem. Like, yeah. I wish I had me helping me right now. But, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, the, the definitely is the, you know, not only that, but the way I really modeled it was it, it's not super innovative in my mind because it's kind of like what you would have if you were at a major technology company that has a bunch of different divisions and they have their own product development, their own sales and marketing, but there's typically a global or a major accounts group that manages their top few hundred customers that helps these smaller divisions get to the senior executives and kind of manage that relationship. The only difference is we didn't own 100%. We own a piece of these other companies. And what it did was it just, you know, the, the startup 
typically it doesn't have that kind of sales and marketing muscle. It's going to take years for them to build that up to get that kind of exposure. It just shaves that cycle time, which is a great IRR for from an investor standpoint if we can take you know, take some cycles out of uh, getting, you know, their time to market. At the same time, if you can augment that with kind of helping them build up that muscle from a process, from a recruiting uh, standpoint, that was kind of the thesis of doing that. So, and, you know, help them, you know, you know, what kind of talent do you need, what stage and, you know, over and above just, you know, getting the right companies that are going to adopt their technologies a lot quicker. So uh, all the same principles applying kind of even as a standalone startup right now, we, we have to be very careful with our, you know, our, our sales and marketing spend and make sure we're segmenting and targeting and, and getting to the companies in each vertical that are further down the kind of adoption path that's going to be the perfect fit for, you know, our real-time streaming analytics uh, monitoring solutions so you know i don't need as much help as some of the other ones did but uh definitely uh, saw a lot of value in it yeah i mean you know we we talked to a lot of uh executives like cios ctos on it visionaries and then you know cmos on marketing trends i think you know, one of the things that is just a common thread of all these people is like they're looking for cutting edge technologies that they can implement and if they have a someone doing the vetting for them which like they already use vc funds as a proxy trusted trusted advisor someone's already kind of vetted it out yep. and look you know the smart money is already going in there and it, it's a good it's a good uh sorting mechanism for them and we'd we'd bring a i mean a lot of those those companies we'd have you know a lot that would start a cadence with us and and uh, we spent a lot of time with them and you know, not just with our own portfolio companies, but kind of guiding the, you know, just because we didn't invest in them doesn't mean they aren't, you know, we're going to be great companies. They're, we might be conflicted out or it was just not the right timing or, or we might not have the bandwidth. Uh, so we'd guide them to all sorts of companies in the ecosystem. And, you know, it, it saved a lot of cycle time for the customers as well. Did you ever have some of those companies kind of over leverage uh, some of the startups. I know this is something you've talked about a little bit in the past about how they can go into those meetings knowing that they're a pretty big company and, you know, they're not going to sign your master service agreement or whatever it is. And they have the uh, the opportunity to say, hey, could you build this thing? Uh, and the startup kind of has to listen to it. Or is it just kind of all come out of the wash? Uh, oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A big company can tip a startup over pretty quickly if both sides aren't careful. So you got to be able to qualify. Look, it's a two-way street from a qualification standpoint. It's not just the big company picking a startup technology. It's, you know, the, the startup's got to have some focus and some discipline and maturity around, you know, is this the right thing to do? Is that, am I going to end up being, you know, making a one-off for them that's not going to serve my broader market? So you got to be disciplined there. I want to switch gears to, uh, to what you look for in talent. Like what are the type of people that you've kind of selected from a mindset perspective that you want on the team? Yeah, I think it depends on the role and whether it's a individual contributor, a manager, a leader, and is it sales, is it marketing? Is it more on the customer success side? I talked a lot about at least my kind of high level criteria for sellers and I kind of bucketed into what I call success themes. Uh, and a lot of it, it's not necessarily, you know, what, you know, there's the big bucket that everybody looks at as far as track record in the business, right? You know, what school they went to, what kind of jobs they've had, how they performed. So that's the easier thing to flush out. I like to go a little earlier in the career and kind of find out what makes them tick and what are their more character type issues and success themes, things like, you know, courage and focus and discipline and, and how much kind of charisma or woo do they have. You know what have they overcome in their life? Uh, a lot of a lot of these things, as far as how people are wired, or you know, well baked way before they hit a a university. So, what kinds of things they've had to overcome early in life, as well as throughout their entire career, and kind of where they're at from a life stage standpoint? Because just because somebody was successful, you know, a few years ago with X Y Z company is going to be completely different now if they're at a different life stage. So, uh, it's a three hundred and sixty view. I really, I, I have a personal affinity to, you know, the junior military officers and, and, and team sport type, uh, you know, NCAA athletes, uh, particularly on the selling side, just because of the, the discipline and the focus they can take a beating, not just from me, but from, <laughs> <laughs> but from a customer, right? They don't necessarily hear no as easily. They'll run through a wall for you with the right 
training, mentorship, and leadership. And they'll also do that for their customers and prospects. They'll do what's right. They'll, they can push through resistance. And, and they can also follow a process more so than uh, somebody would, that might not have that background. But it could also be things like student government and all sorts of different backgrounds as far as you get into the, you know, the earlier parts of their career. So on the marketing side, there's you know, multiple buckets. Depends on what kind of marketer. Are we talking about the creative side? Are we talking about demand gen? Demand gen type folks, I want hardcore systems process oriented. I definitely need the creative types on the content side, but also with the discipline to, to crank out content uh, very quickly. The granularity on the technical product marketing side, I mean, the harder core engineering, but but the ability to work left uh, upstream with product management and, and engineering, as well as to traverse all the way over to understand the, the customer's side of the equation is is a very, very unique skill, I think, from a technical product marketing standpoint. So having that kind of you know, technical customer facing nuance is super important. And look, kind of the front line of of an enterprise selling organization that doesn't get enough credit is the sales engineers or the solution architects. Mm-hmm. I mean, these these are folks that are just hardcore, deep into your product, your market, your personas, up and down the stack, all the ecosystem around it. And then you're asking them to be customer facing as well. That's a very unique blend, probably the gold it, from a hiring standpoint, you know, then the gems that we're always looking for. And, and we want to make sure we invest fairly heavily in them as well. So, you know, it really depends on the role, but the big key, if I had any advice for, you know, younger entrepreneurs out there is, you know, understand what you're your hiring criteria is what it's going to take to be successful. Be able to articulate that, write it down, put it in the job spec. Make sure all your managers are kind of sticking to the success themes. And and look, you might need to adjust them, but and you kind of understand and you know where you can pull them from as far as companies just been acquired. And you know, there's this they're the startup guys that like the growth piece, and now they're in a big company. Let's go grab those guys or gals that were there early. And have been through that whole ride, they're the ones that are going to probably be attracted to your type of opportunity now. And I have a list, you know, right now that I'm working off of those types of scenarios, right? We want people that like that building process and like to go through the sausage making and to see something come to fruition when it all starts to come together, everything working flawlessly. Sales, marketing, customer success. Anything that you're dealing with people, uh, you know, buying and renewing the product have huge highs and huge lows. How have you like went through your career and dealt with like the highs and lows yourself? And then how do you do that with advise your team to deal with that? Look, you probably, uh, I probably remember the the hits or the lows. I, those are the ones that stick with me a little bit longer, but you have to have a pretty short memory, right? And I like to joke, I've never lost a deal. I've just run out of time. And some of my best selling jobs have been getting a customer not to buy somebody else's stuff, right? Even yep. though they didn't buy from us, you know, so slowing something down when you know they're going down the wrong path. But uh, I look, I think it's a short memory. You know, there's there's always the next quarter. There's always a chance to make up if you're taking a hit or you're you're not, you know, on time. And, and probably the secret sauce of, of the whole sales process is just to simplify it is look there's a clock and there's a scoreboard there's a clock and a scoreboard and depending on what kind of business you're in but you know you might be in a kind of a bottoms up transactional type business that's kind of a month to month clock and a scoreboard and more of the the higher end enterprise that's you know quarter to quarter and you know you got to keep your eye on both at the same time and manage that. And if you do a good job managing that, you know, putting enough points up inside the allotted time, you're going to be successful over the long term. It might be a little lumpy, but, and you can make up and, or you might get ahead, but you might need to be ahead. So uh, having that kind of sports mentality, I think helps a lot. Short memory, clock and a scoreboard, learn the system, be rigorous around that system, do what's right by the customer and, you know, the other big thing is selling. I think selling and marketing is fairly simple. I mean, it's it's kind of a battle back and forth. It's, you know, you're either, and a lot of it's in between your own ears, uh, you're either selling or you're sold. 
Mm-hmm. Right. They sell you on why they can't do something, you know, use your solution or in your time frame and or, you know, you sell them on why, you know, what the value of doing that is. Right. And are you arming yourself with the right process, the right messaging, the right product, getting the right people on the other side to go uh, help them on that customer journey? And over, you know, if you're doing the right things and you're you're understanding what their initiatives are. It's not that hard to go articulate what the critical capabilities are, the people, the process, and the tech from your side that can go help them accomplish those already funded strategies, initiatives that are going on inside their company. So I think that's kind of the more simplified secret sauce of sales and marketing. How much are you involved in deals now? When is it when is it escalated to mark? Uh, what are those type of things? When you get the request from the the AE, it says like, "Hey, could Mark be in on this uh, this one?" Yeah, sometimes it's the other way around. I just demand, <laughs> right? So it's not necessarily a, a request. Is uh, we're going out there, right? So look, it's a lot of it's a divide and conquer with the management team getting the right resource in the right place at the right time to kind of move the chains of the campaign. And, you know, I kind of work my way down on the bigger, more strategic ones. And it doesn't have to be necessarily be a big deal. It might just be a small starter deal, but it's with a really big, mm-hmm. important prospect. And uh, that land uh, we know is going to be super important to the expand. So we spent a lot of time on segmenting and targeting, dividing up between not only my management team, but, you know, we use our CTO, we use guys like Rajesh in certain cases, our chief architect, uh, our VP of Inge, Karthik at the right time. You know, it's around getting, you know, right people mapped up that can move the chains and help our customer in their journey. I don't know if you use this term anymore, but how do you all share the band? What does, what does attribution look like between sales, marketing, customer success um, within the org? Share the band. Uh, like attribution, we we spent a ton of time on attribution. Uh, one of the advantages of having sales and marketing underneath me is if the fingers start getting pointed, I can just iron things out or mm-hmm. break the fingers and just <laughs> uh, so you know making sure there is as little friction between the two as possible. Look, it's all about building that top of funnel and making sure there's a smooth process down through the funnel. Uh, you know, I've re- early on, we we didn't have enough top of the funnel. And so Tom got, you know, roughed up quite a bit. Then all of a sudden we got too much funnel and we then we had a bulge in the funnel. So everybody was getting roughed up till we unpacked what was causing the bulge. So sometimes it, it won't sort its way out if, you know, you got sales and marketing just sitting there pointing fingers at each other. So I'll, I like, jumping in and get my hands dirty and unpacking those situations as quick as possible. Any moments in your like career where you kind of had that look in the mirror, like, what am I, what am I doing here? Or like, is this, is it time to just hang up the cleats and say, uh, I, I just need to be coaching high school football or something? Uh, I, I, you know, I would do high school sports if it wasn't for all the parents. <laughs> That's what my dad always used to say. <laughs> my dad always used to say that uh, about Boy Scouts. He'd be like, yeah. oh, Scouts are no problem. The parents are the worst. No, I actually, I did coach youth in high school lacrosse. Not that I ever played it, but, uh, uh, you know, I I don't see hanging it up, you know, as long as I'm healthy. I, I like, I like to compete and I like to build teams and see them go help sell and market and deploy and see customers get delighted with what we're doing to improve their business. I mean, we're we're at a massive macro trends where things like DTC, direct to consumer, companies are having to become software companies if they're in traditional businesses or they're going to cease to exist and or they're going to get replaced by uh, startups. Uh, it's fun to, to be in this business right now. And I don't see hanging up the cleats unless I'm physically, I mean, they'll have to drag me off the field. <laughs> I guess when you, you're, you know, your arm goes and you're playing quarterback, you, you can go back to the sideline, but I don't see that happening as long as I'm healthy. What questions do you never get asked um, that you wish you were asked more? Uh, could I pay more? 
<laughs> you know what I I just I call that the I don't know if I don't know if I made this up or if I stole it from someone, but call that the Goldilocks close is is this price way too high, way too low, or about right? Uh, never they never say uh, never say that it's uh, way too low. Fortunately. No, they'll always always be grinding. Look, I you know I think uh, if you're doing a good job on on that front of putting together a business value assessment or an ROI, not cutting any corners as a as a selling organization and and helping a customer with you know here's kind of the criteria we're seeing other customers go through. Here's where they're getting uh, returns by making these types of investments. Uh, I think. That's the kind of trusted advisor uh, relationship I want our organization to be doing and to be known for. So, um, but I don't know. I haven't thought about that one, but questions I haven't been asked, but that's definitely one I don't get asked very often. Yes, there you go. Do you have a group of mentors that you go to that, that are people that you can run stuff by? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm probably not one of those, hey, I have an official, you know, a list of uh, mentors. I'm a, definitely a student of the game. I will, it's like any anything in coaching, they, you know, I'll rip something off and, you know, a, you know, a sales play, a marketing play, a process. I'm always looking for what works well, what doesn't work well and, and adjusting that. I, I read a lot. I mean, obviously I'm in a pretty good you know, I, I have a pretty good network. I always have my ear to the ground, but you know, I think the mentor thing—you you can learn a lot from people in the field or people that might be may more subordinates as well as peers, as well as people that are higher up in positions. I learn a lot from our from our customer and prospect base. Mm-hmm. You know, getting a chance to, you know, at Andreessen and Horowitz, they mostly came to us, but on and on this side, I, you know, I'm out, I'm on the road a lot. I really enjoy being all, you know, in a lot of different companies yeah. and understanding how they're transforming and or advancing their business initiatives and strategies. I think that's kind of the secret sauce and probably the thing that's kept my intellectual curiosity so high in this business is it's a chance to, you know, get out and talk to some of the most uh, interesting and innovative companies across all verticals including the government and and just try to help them with what they're trying to get, you know, what they're trying to accomplish from a di- you know, in this role from a digital s- transformation standpoint. So that keeps me stimulated. Yeah, so. you know, it's why I mean, it's literally why we're building the network of shows that we're building for this exact reason. Like, what is happening at the cutting edge is not being broadcasted. You know what I right. mean? Th- like those type of conversations, you like, you can't follow those these people on Twitter. You can't do whatever. Like. And the way that we used to find that information is like maybe a magazine article or something like that, or, you know, maybe they got interviewed by a local paper or something, but like that stuff wasn't bro- like the fact that you can get tactics from people with multi-billion dollar budgets that are talking about how they think about the future. Like what a freaking time to be alive. Yeah. A lot of them are doing it too. I mean, I just recently worked with, uh, and like, this is kind of a manifestation of, of that, product market timing fit that we think uh, Signal FX is definitely hitting in the inflection point with. Uh, as I was you know, working with a couple of customers, some of them were like moving from 30, 40,000 hosts running their environment uh, in AWS down to three or 4,000. Yeah. And they're packing 100 containers on top of it, re-architecting. And these are born, this is a born in the cloud company. This isn't a, in a newer company. It's, it's not one that's you know, it's not somebody that's been around, you know, G2000 type company. It's a big tech company. And uh, that's pretty, I mean, very dramatic and exciting and right in the wheelhouse. And everybody, and a lot, and, and then the G2000 is doing the same things. They're moving from, you know, 20,000 on prem servers to, you know, starting with four or 5,000 and they're going to transform their whole business to, to digital from, from DTC type initiatives, you know, direct to consumer and to get closer to the customer as well as, in, you know, taking out, it might be an IOT in, in, the mar- in the manufacturing space where they're, you know, it's more around new product development and changing their entire business model. Instead of selling hardware, they're, they're going to sell services and connections with the equipment that they're making as well as, you know, taking out a lot of 
operational efficiency type initiatives and, and using software to you know, increase their bottom line, not just their top line. So uh, a lot of interesting things going out there across, across all verticals. Yeah, I was talking to a um, was talking to a CIO, and they were talking about how they have forty agencies alone that they work with that they have to partner with for like their marketing stuff, and that that's like part of this like as we were kind of talking about like this you know technology CIO CTO roles that now permeate the entire organization. You're talking like. How do you even communicate with 40 agencies? It's like, how yeah, do you even keep- a lot to manage. Right? And so, and I Sounds think- Sounds like there might be a startup in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, but I think, you know, with technology and the amount of servers, the amount of things and like, you know, the digital transformation, I mean, like, want to talk about it, the most loaded term probably in existence right now, maybe yeah. not in existence, but from a business tr- standpoint, it is. I mean, these digital transformations that you're talking about, I mean, people wake up every single day and are freaking out about like, what does this look like in 10 years? They have to talk to their board once a quarter mm-hmm. about their digital transformation. What an exciting time to be a startup that's that's working on that, right? Yeah, you just got to be careful where you're, where you're putting your wood behind which arrows. So. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Anything we miss? Any, uh, any stuff to plug here? No, I appreciate you having us on the program and look forward to talking to you guys in the future. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Mark. We appreciate it. Thank you. Mission Daily and all of our podcasts are created with love by our team at mission.org. We own and operate a network of podcasts and a brand and story studio designed to accelerate learning. Our clients include companies like Salesforce, they're a customer times five, Twilio, and Katera, who work with us because we produce results. To learn more and get our case studies, check out mission.org slash studios. If you're tired of media and news that promotes fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and if you want an antidote to all that chaos, you're at the right place. Subscribe here and to our daily newsletter at mission.org. Each morning, you'll get a newsletter that will help you start your morning and your day off right.